Be before we start, I'd like to make some announcements. So first, regarding posters, um, they, our, the organizers have requested to make sure you take your posters down at night after the poster session because we're sharing the space with, with, it's a joint conference, so we're sharing the space for the posters and make sure you take it down. Um, another announcement is that new this year at ICML, you probably have noticed that the webpage we have childcare available. And although it might be too late to, to plan that, that's gonna be available also for NIPS and future ICML, so you can Use that, take that into account in your planning for travel. The other announcement is um, there's an LGBTQ plus or an ally meetup this Saturday at 7 p.m. And for more information, you can look at the WALVA app and for, for more details. Oh, I, I, before I forget, another announcement is, again, make sure you check the online schedule because it's the most updated schedule. There we have several last minute changes, so refer to the online schedule for, for, the, exact, um, for, for the exact logistics and, and timing for all the talks. So let's wait a little bit for people to come. Okay, so, so welcome everyone. And it's my pleasure to introduce our invited speaker for, for today, Max Welling. He is a research chair at University of Amsterdam and, and the VP of Technologies at Qualcomm and also at, at CIFAR. And he did his PhD at uh, with, with the Nobel laureate G.T. Hooft in theoretical physics and did postdocs at several places, Caltech, UCL, and, and University of Toronto. And he served a, our community for, with many different positions as, as board of, of the NIPS Foundation. He's general chair or program chair of, of NIPS. I, AI Stats, ECCV, and also uh, an upcoming conference, MIDL, and, and served also in many editorial boards in machine learning journals. So he has made several contributions in machine learning, in Bayesian inference and deep learning, and has won several awards, including the ECCV, Condrick, Award and also the NSF Career Award. So I am happy to to welcome Max and let's give him an applause. All right. Thank you, Jennifer, for those kind words and uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming and also thanks to the organizers for inviting me here today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about intelligence and uh, energy consumption and ways to reduce it. Um, so first, the introduction. So an alternative title for my talk could have been an equation, um, F equals E minus H. And without telling you what F and E and H stand for, I invite you to uh, look at these Dutch celebrities. This is Daphne Schippers, who is the world champion on the 200 meters uh, sprint. And this is Ben Feringa, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2016. And from those, you should be able to figure out what E and H are. So it's free energy is energy minus entropy. And this will be the continuing theme uh, throughout my talk today. And there is a very interesting analogy with history which is that um, you know, the energy, which is our ability to perform physical work, um, basically is uh, reflected in the Industrial Revolution in the 1820s, where we started to uh, 
sort of change, interchange human labor with mechanized labor. And in the 1940s, you know, we started to use data um, and information to make our society more efficient. And of course, that reflects the entropy, which is the level of organization or information in a system. And already, uh, so long time ago, the physicists realized that um, the physical world can be described by in terms of information content. And John Archibald Wheeler said famously, it from bit, to reflect this. And this is a quote. It says, it from bit symbolizes the idea that every item of the physical world has, a, uh, has at bottom an immaterial source and explanation that all things physical are information theoretic in origin. So basically he said that information is at the very core of everything and that all of physics can be explained by looking at its information content. Now more recently, um, this statement has you know, gotten shape in terms of a number of theories. Um, and as I have been trained in physics, I think I can say a few things about it, but not too much because I also forgot a lot. And um, so the first thing that is very interesting is that uh, people like Stephen Hawking realized that black holes are really, really thermodynamic objects where the information content um, is sort of uh, the, the entropy is proportional to the uh, area of the event horizon. So you can think of a black hole basically as uh, you know, bits and bytes which are projected onto the horizon of the black hole. Um, and this idea got extended into what's now known as the holographic principle, which was posed by Gerard at Hoofd, uh, which is also my supervisor and Nobel laureate, that basically says that poses that all the information you need to describe everything in the, in the universe can be sort of encoded on the, horizon, on the uh, sort of sur surface of the universe. The black hole being a part of that surface, but there's also an outer surface. Um, and you can basically encode all the information you need about physics on that surface. So that's like a hologram if you want. And more recently, uh, sort of uh, my colleague at the University of Amsterdam took this idea one step further and said that uh, gravity really is an entropic force. Now, what is an entropic force? Um, if you think of a, of a molecule, a long molecule, and you stretch it, and it's at a certain temperature, you'll find that by basically thermal fluctuation, it will want to curl up. And the only reason that it wants to curl up is that there's many more states, curled states, than there is extended states. And that is, and, and by that mechanism, it's, it's exerting a force on the molecule if you keep it stretched. So that same idea, according to Eric Verlinde, explains gravity, which is basically saying there is information content and that's moving around, it's trying to get to a higher entropy state, and by moving around, it's exerting a force on bodies that uh, explains all of gravity. So, um, the most important thing is that physicists have made a lot of progress in tying together energy, physics, and entropy information. And maybe this relation is most beautifully exposed in this uh, story, which is Maxwell's demon, um, that is tr trying to find an argument to see if you can beat the second law of thermodynamics. So the second law of thermodynamics basically says that the entropy of any closed system should always increase. And uh, so that the change in, so that the amount of work you can perform is proportional to the change in the free energy, which is equal to minus the change in the energy minus the change in the entropy. And since the entropy always increases, the entropy really represents sort of the, the part of the free energy that cannot be converted into work. So it's like part of your energy you cannot actually convert convert into physical wor work, and so this entropy is sort of like a barrier to that. And um, Maxwell's demon is the following sort of observation. If you have two chambers, uh, one is a cold chamber and one is a hot chamber, 
Um, and there's a little creature here which observes the molecules that are flying around in these two chambers. It's uh, letting the cold molecules through in this direction and the hot molecules going back into this direction. And by doing that, it could sort of heat up this chamber and cool down this chamber, which is exactly in the opposite direction of what the second law of thermodynamics says, because that means that the entropy will actually decrease. And because this is getting hotter, you can sort of uh, cook uh, some, some egg, and uh, you will do physical work. So that seems to run against the second law of thermodynamics. And maybe it's even more beautifully exposed in this thought experiment by Zellar, um, which is a one molecule version of that argument, which says that if you have a chamber and there's a single molecule in that, um, then you can extract work from this if you know where the molecule is, because you're going to put some kind of divider in this chamber. And then um, if you know if it's on the right hand side, you construct a pulley here with a little bit of a weight, and then it will hit this boundary to the left, and it will shift the boundary, and then you can actually do a little bit of work. So the, the important thing is that by knowing where the molecule is, which is one bit of information to the left or to the right, you can extract sort of a minimal amount of work from this uh, system. So, um, OK, so this seems like we can break the second law of thermodynamics. But in fact, the, I think the resolution to this problem um, comes from Jaynes, which is uh, somebody we all know from maximum entropy models, who basically said something really fundamental. He said that the free energy that physicists write down is not really only a property of the physical system. It is a subjective quantity. It reflects our ignorance about what we are modeling. And in particular, the entropy that is in the uh, free energy reflects the degree of ignorance that we have about the microscopic state or the microscopic degrees of freedom of that system, right? So that's a bit of a revolutionary statement at the time. It's basically saying, you know, physics is subjective. At least this free energy is subjective. And so following that, it actually seems like if we remove that uncertainty about the system, we could actually uh, turn uh, that information into real work. Now, it's not that easy. In fact, the full resolution is that to do these measurements, you know, you have to typically do work. Um, and it's even more subtle than that. You can actually do these measurements without doing work in some limit. But you have to write down that information in memory. And by the time you're deleting that memory, you're going to actually pay for the energy. And, you know, you increase the entropy again. Um, and so the cycle is then complete, right? because by the time you're going to reuse that memory, um, you're going to pay back the sort of the entropy that you gained by learning about the system. So that saves at least the second law of thermodynamics. But what we learned in the meantime is that we should really think about modeling as a subjective exercise. And, it, and, and the entropy is our ignorance about the system. It's our ignorance about the system, not a property of the physical system per se. And of course, we all know this story. As ho many of you ho hopefully bought into the idea maybe that you know, the modeling is a intrinsically subjective exercise. And of course, this was already sort of used by, by Bayes or the principle of Bayesian statistics. And just to, uh, to repeat a little bit what you probably already know, in Bayesian statistics, the central object of interest is the probability of the data. So capital X is the full sort of data matrix. And you write that as an integral over a prior, which is your, your prior, your subjective prior, over what you think the parameters of the model could look like. Um, and then there's a likelihood term, which is the data given that model parameter. And then you have to integrate over all possible parameter values that you think are reasonable. Um, and then if you make predictions, uh, you shouldn't make a prediction based on a single model. What you should do is first compute your posterior distribution, which is the, your uncertainty over the model parameters, given that you have made some observations. And you compute that posterior by this famous Bayes rule. Um, and then you average over those. You weight all of the parameters by that posterior distribution in order to make your predictions. Right? But the most important thing is that that is actually a subjective way to model the world. And then um, going one step further, um, 
Rizanen uh, had sort of uh, this paper modeling by shortest data description. He explained how you can think of um, finding the optimal complexity of a model by looking at description length. So he basically posed that the object one should look at is the number of bits you need to use in order to encode your hypothesis. Think of maybe the model, you know, the parameters of your model, um, plus a term which is the number of bits you need in order to encode your data given your hypothesis. And these two terms need to balance. And so if you translate that into sort of uh, maybe more familiar sort of probability distributions, Bayesian sort of uh, language, the first term is the probability of x given the parameters, the log of that, but then the expectation over the posterior distribution. And the second term is the KL between the posterior distribution and the prior. So this term is the complexity of your model, number of bits you require to encode your hypothesis. And this is order one. So in other words, it doesn't depend, it doesn't scale with the number of data points that you have. And this term here, uh, since this is basically a product over the data points, it scales with uh, n. Uh, so this is a sum over n terms. Uh, it's the bits you require to encode your hypothesis. And since this scales with n and this scales with 1, it means that if you have a really small data set, you cannot use a lot of bits to encode your model. But if your data set starts to grow, then you can entertain larger and larger models uh, because basically this term is starting to grow as well. And if you want to read more about this, there's this beautiful book by Peter Grunewald that explains all about these ideas. And then, um, so the last of my list of heroes, um, Jeff Hinton, um, who draw, drew from these ideas and um, in his famous paper, uh, Keeping Neural Networks Simple by minimum, Minimizing the Description Length of, of the Weights, and later also by this paper with Radford Neal, where he just uh, wrote down the math of variational inference. You know, um, he wrote down sort of the variational formulation of uh, of the free energy. So you, you, write, you start with writing down the log probability of the data, and um, you introduce this sort of auxiliary distribution Q, which at this point can be anything. It has to be normalized, but it can be anything. And um, so you take the average of the likelihood term over that posterior minus you know, this KL term, which again is the distance between this sort of approximate posterior and your prior, and then another term, which is to close the gap between the difference between the true posterior and your variational posterior. So this is not hard to derive, um, and it's an equality. Um, turns out that this last term is very hard to get access to because you can't really typically compute this posterior distribution in closed form. So you leave it out, and then it's a bound. And then, uh, so you can write it like this. So, um, you, know, the, you know, the data term minus this sort of complexity term. And if you uh, move one part you know, the prior term to this in, into here, then it really looks like an energy and an entropy term. So this is the entropy of the distribution Q, um, and this is then sort of the, the interpreted as the energy. So we can, we can really say that this is also a free energy, and now it's a free energy of a model. It's not the free energy of the physical world, but it's a free energy of a model. Um, and so this is the energy term, and that's the entropy term. So then, so what, what have we just done? Um, so we started with the Helmholtz free energy, which is an en a free energy of a physical system. Then Jane said, well, you know, the entropy is really your ignorance. So it's not just only physics. It's actually also subjective. It's also your, you know, your ignorance that's in that equation. So then we go to Rizanen, who writes down sort of a minimum description length, which is a quantity about the model. Um, then Hinton, who writes down variational Bayes, again, a free energy, explicit expression for a free energy uh, for the model. So this is the modeling side, and here's the physics side. Right? And now I'm going to propose in this talk you know, to close the circle and say, can we use the entropy that is um, in our sort of model free energy, can we use it to run uh, sort of our machine learning models more efficiently? This means using less actual physical power 
um, on a real device. So here we're closing that gap back to, to physics. Um, and uh, you, know, you could argue that the brain has been sort of exploiting this idea. It's a very noisy sort of machine that, uh, that has you know, leveraged, perhaps, the fact that you can use this noise and this uncertainty to do very uh, energy efficient computation. So this is a bit speculative, but um, I hope you bear with me. So there is what we will talk about today. So in the next part of the talk, I'll say a few words about large scale um, approximate Bayesian learning um, and a bit about uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo and variational Bayes. OK, so this is uh, my sort of uh, pendulum. I've been swinging between, so this is not about US politics. I know where I stand in US politics, but I've been swinging between Markov chain Monte Carlo as the best way to do um, sort of approximate Bayesian inference and variational Bayes. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about both of these. 